Hi guys and welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 26 of Ultimate Mobility Experiment and my name is Robbie Cassidy. Today I've brought on a guest, a good friend of mine, a guy I went to college with for years and who has now continued on and he, he's doing his PhD above in AIT. So uh, Larkin Daly, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a million for, thanks a million for joining us. Uh, do you want to give us a quick intro of what you're doing at the moment and what you're studying? Yeah, thanks a million for having me, Robbie. Delighted to be on. Um, yeah, so my name is Larkin Daly. I'm in the final year of my PhD project in Athlone IT. So we're looking at fatigue and recovery in Gaelic games. Um, so just to give, I suppose, a brief overview, we wanted to investigate what happens to Gaelic football players during and after a game for study one. Uh, and we also want to examine the influence of different components of fitness on their in-game workload, the performance attenuation, so say their decline due to fatigue during the day, and also the post-match recovery after the match. And then our current research, we're looking at recovery strategies in all Gaelic games athletes. So that's what we're doing at the minute. Excellent, excellent. So what, what uh, type of studies have you ever, what are the titles of the studies that you've, you've put out so far? And just to give us a really brief overview of, of some of the stuff that you found. Um, so the first study we had was Gaelic football match play, performance attenuation and the timeline of recovery. Um, so I suppose put simply, we kind of assess players before and after a game just to see how much fatigue the game induced, how much muscle damage, things like that. So we assess them before the game at halftime and then post-match. And then we assess them again a day after and then two days after just to kind of map out the timeline of recovery and just the extent of fatigue. And we also looked at uh, how much workload they completed. So their total distances, their sprints. And we looked at all these interactions between fatigue, recovery, and then workload during the game. Excellent. And then just, uh, you sent me on the, the presentation that you did for the, um, was it was it the strength and conditioning council, Irish strength and conditioning, who was it for? Yeah, so they had, uh, yeah, a group. So we presented to all them. So that kind of gave us good feedback just from a practitioner's standpoint, just, how we might kind of use our research to guide your training or things of that or assess how long it takes for players to recover. Excellent. Um, so go there's ahead, lots Jack. of stuff for that uh, just done in other sports. So there's not much in Gaelic football. So it's obviously very important that we do that for Gaelic football specifically because it's kind of a niche thing, you know. Exactly, exactly. And there's such a, such a, it's, it's, it's not comparable to many sports. I suppose Australian football is probably the closest one that you could compare to. Um, but a, a lot of the work is done, a lot of the research I could imagine is done in, in, in rugby and soccer. But yeah. So looking at that, that presentation, first, the, the first study you did, I want to just talk a small bit about you were quantifying performance and recovery. And how did you do that? How did you quantify performance and recovery in that study? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we assessed a number of things. We assessed the players' markers of muscle damage. So before, during and after the game. So basically, that's a, a finger prick, a blood drop analysis. And this is going to measure creatine kinase. So this is kind of going to give us um, an indicator for how much muscle damage the players have. So obviously the day after and two days after, it's going to get higher after the game as they're kind of sore and have muscle damage. Um, we also assessed fatigue. So neuromuscular fatigue, we looked at jumps. So they did a drop jump and a counter movement jump. So that basically means as you get tired, your jump isn't going to be as high. So it might be 8% lower or something like that. We can kind of map that out. And we also used perceptual measurements. So we just asked the players a simple kind of, it was Likert scale questionnaire, it's called. So just one to five, how sore do you feel? How did you sleep last night? What's your mood, stress, things of like that. And then we kind of compile all this data together and we can get a good overall picture of how prepared the, the players are to train again or how fatigued they are or if they have a lot of muscle damage, things like that. Okay, good. And so well, when we were talking about this, because we did, we went, we were, I called you last week once you sent me on that um once you sent me on that presentation i called you after just to talk through a few things this before we had even really nailed down a podcast or so that we go through it and we obviously talked for an hour an hour and a half on it so there's yeah. enough to, to enough to, to to go on about but within the, that study you found that one day post-match there was significant increase in uh in a creatine kinase was it in the blood after it and then that was still there two to three days after so what what does that mean or what what would that mean to, to someone who doesn't understand it yeah, so interestingly, every, every other measure we had had returned to the pre-match baseline. So all the markers of fatigue were showed, showed that there was the highest fatigue one day after a match, so 24 hours post. Um, everything except the perceptual measure. So that was actually the most decremented just immediately post-match. Uh, but the fact that the creatine kinase was still elevated two, two, uh, two days post-match, that kind of might suggest that there's some ongoing muscle damage still there. 
Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't test a day further because the players nearly always had another training session and obviously that would have interfered with our results. Um, but we would like to say it probably be in around at baseline three days post-match. So just based on that, I suppose you can generally say recovery after a Gaelic football match takes about two to three days to be fully recovered. Okay. And then what does the, what's creating uh, kinase or creating kinase? What, what, what does that, why are you measuring that exactly? Yeah. So it's a, a good marker. It gives us, it's basically present in your muscles. Okay. So if you're doing exercises with say acceleration, sprints, things like that, they're very, very heavy exercise, strenuous. Um, so they're going to cause some cracks in your muscle and this basically stuff can leak into the blood. And then we just take a marker of that. We can say if it's a much, if it's, if the number is very high, we can say there's a lot of muscle damage or if it's very low, you're probably recovered. Um, so it just gives us a good trend of, how the athletes are if they have a lot of muscle damage or if they're prepared to train again fair enough okay and then like looking at that uh look, looking at other research and and uh looking at players or, or athletes who have a high level of creatine kinase in their blood uh before they perform does that mean and then does that does that show that they'll perform worse or better or how what does it mean yeah so if, if that's high it probably means you're in a state of you have a lot of muscle soreness and you have muscle damage so that's going to negatively affect your performance I suppose, interestingly, we found that the players' ma- or CK before the match was actually uh, relatively higher than other sports. So that kind of might suggest that they may have maybe had a training session recently or a match that was maybe a bit too strenuous and they came into their match in the middle of the season uh, with some muscle damage. So that would negatively affect your performance. Um, so there's research in Australian rules that shows uh, it negatively impacts players' workload. So if you have a high CK before a match, you might cover less distance, perform less sprints, less accelerations, things like that. So all those things are obviously very important for your overall performance. Um, there's other research that saw, uh, showed that coaches rate athletes worse who have a high CK and they've reduced technical proficiencies so they might miss more passes, things like that. So it just uh, negatively affects a lot of key areas that would be key to Gaelic football. Um, so it's an important thing to note that you wouldn't want it high before a match. Perfect. And then when, like, like a lot of people and even myself when I'm playing, and I'm sure yourself when you're competing as well, uh, because Larkin has have you an Irish title or two Irish titles in, in weightlifting at the moment. So he's oh, just, uh, one. Uh, just the one. So he's uh, just the one. I don't know if that's, but still, yeah. still a, a serious, serious performer or an elite athlete uh, at, at his own game. So you well, yourself, uh, you yourself, you yourself take, uh, say, creatine, um, or you have taken creatine in the past, have you? Yeah, I've probably taken it for about five or six years now, so ongoing. Okay, long-term. and has that well, like, what are the what's the research saying? Because uh, I know we discussed this before, and you were saying that it's not directly related to to creatine kinase, isn't it? But what's the research saying about creatine supplementation, um, and has it any effect on recovery? Uh, creatine supplementation, I think, can has been shown to boost recovery. So, in a similar way to having good nutrition, if you've high carbohydrates after the game. It'll replenish your glycogen. So similarly, if you're supplementing with creatine, um, what creatine basically does is provide fuel for the working muscles when you're doing very intense exercise. So a lot of sprints or even in the gym, if you're doing, let's we'll say if you normally do 10 reps and you start supplementing with creatine, you might get 11 reps. So things like that. So it just gives you fuel for these kind of high intensity stuff. Um, so if you are supplementing, you're bound to recover a little bit better just because it's more fuel to re- uh, restore uh, replenish what's missing in the muscles so that you should be ready to go quicker so it definitely is a good idea i'd say for getting footballers if, if they don't already to supplement or creatine to look into that to boost their performance and recovery i would say um, okay and then when you were looking at so you looked at you said perception uh you looked at creatine kinase and blood but you also looked at neuromuscular uh, effects didn't you in in this study so what what neuromuscular um or effects how, how did you measure those uh, so yeah, we measured those with uh, counter movement jump and drop jump. Uh, so the drop uh, counter movement jump is basically with your hands and your hips, uh, you squat down to whatever height you want, and then immediately you jump straight up. So it's kind of a vertical jump, except you don't have the use of your hands. So there's, there's not as much variation in technique. And the drop jump then is you're coming off a step, same thing with the hands and the hips, and then immediately straight up. So we can get a few markers from that. We can get the height you jumped. We can get your reactive strength from the drop jump. So that's basically uh, the your height that you jumped divided by the time on the ground. So that gives us a few kind of good markers just to assess how your muscles are performing. Um, so what we saw with that, obviously, it actually went up a little bit at halftime. It was non-significant. 
So that might be the, the players just had had more better for warm up and that they were ready to go. But then towards the end of the match, it went down 24 hours post. It was very low. Okay, so you know yourself after a match, you'd be stiff and sore, and that's when your muscles would be at their worst performance. And then 48 hours, uh, it was back to base, and then so it was more or less recovered, except the CK was still up. Um, so the, the neuromuscular measurements are simple and easy to do, a quick, and they give you a very good uh, assessment of how, how basically your neuromuscular system is, is performing. Okay, and then going off track and, and kind of looking at, at the practical implications of that, would the, would the drop jump, would the counter movement jump, would that be an effective measure for, let's say, coaches to implement with athletes um, at a training session to see where they're at? Uh, to see how they're doing or do you need do you need a lot of equipment to do it or would you need like high-tech equipment to do it yeah um there is some apps i think you can get uh that you could measure them uh the equipment we use the opto jump i think is thousands of euros um so they're probably Gosh. a no go for most <laughs> coaches um but you could do something like a broad jump um so just going out the way instead of just the vertical component um, and that'll probably give you similar markers um, but it's a good kind of thing to measure your training as well. If you're, we say, measuring it every few weeks just to see if it's going up, it's a good sign you're improving your power, we say, in the off-season or something like that, or pre-season. Uh, so it would have a lot of different um, uses in that kind of sense, as well as preparedness to train or compete. Okay. And then, but you you were saying that neuromuscular effect um, or decrement, it was only, it's only two days posted, or is it, or is it only one day posted, and then it's gone? Um, yeah, so we saw the big, the well, the largest decorant, 24 hours post. Um, and it was recovered to baseline at 48 hours post. Oh, but was, okay. the fact that the CK was still elevated, there might be still some muscle damage there. Um, so they oh. might need a third day just to be fully. Uh, but our, our data didn't pick it up at two days that there was a decrement. Okay. There was a huge decrement at one day. And looking at your data then, was there, it, was there a certain like a uh, component of fitness or was there a certain uh, type of exercise that we're doing? Let's say, I know you were saying it was high speed running was, was, was affecting people. Was it the high speed running itself that was affecting um, the neuromuscular effect or no, was, was causing those uh, neuromuscular decrements or was it like total distance covered or was it how, how yeah. like what, what, what was uh, contributing to that? Yeah. So we ran that analysis as well. We looked at all the GPS uh, metrics that we, we had and we basically kind of ran analysis to see, which of these basically was going to predict the most fatigue and the most muscle damage. So which of these caused the most, we say disturbances to players. So when we looked at it, um, total distance wasn't the best predictor, um, but what was a much better predictor of how fatigued players are going to be or how much muscle damage uh, we found high speed running. So sprint speed, a uh, number of sprints, acceleration. So these kind of more high intensity running, they coincided with a lot more fatigue and muscle damage than we say total distance. So I suppose that could be of interest to a lot of coaches, even coaches I've worked with before, they have the main interest in the total distance covered, uh, but maybe sprint speed or number of sprints, um, that might be a better indicator for how much work a player did during a match. That's what our results would suggest anyway. Yeah. Okay. Cause that's, it's true. Like you do, you do see that. And even if you're watching like a premier league game or a champions league game or uh, watching any of those games, all you'll see when the player comes off, they'll, they'll have covered like eleven kilometers or, or, yeah. or ten kilometers. But you're saying from from what your research has shown is that it doesn't make a difference. Not that it doesn't make a difference, but that's not the biggest factor. It's not total distance covered. It's actually how many accelerations you do or how many sprints you do during the game. So, yeah. have you have you some type of uh, like data on what distance people were covering high speed running? Yeah, so their their total distance for the match was around 7.2 uh, kilometers in total. Um, the total number of sprints they might have completed may, maybe 30. Um, and the average sprint distance was about 740 uh, meters. So in around that. Okay, so so 740 meters for the for the whole game. That's that's what people were were getting at. Is that yeah. like was that that's, the top that's form? The two halves, yeah. Um, so that's that's sprint distance covered over 5.5 meters per second. Um, so I think that's around 17 kilometers an hour. Um, okay. So an issue, I suppose, looking at that exclusively. So obviously individual players, one player sprint is going to be whatever he classifies as sprint speed is going to be different to someone else. So we just had a crude marker there. We just had 5.5 meters per second. Um, but if you were in, we'll say an elite football squad or something, you might have individual speed thresholds and you could get even more accurate data on that. Um, 
Okay. So obviously, you know, if you're a slower player, some players, if they're very slow, they might not even reach that speed at all, even though they are sprinting. So yeah. It wouldn't come. So it's important to individualize the GPS things if you can. Um, favorite and a lot of clubs that would are like, be a limitation for us but. yeah a lot of clubs that like you can see now like are obviously all the inter-county guys have them but a lot of clubs are moving towards getting gps's or even renting them that as well at the moment yeah. like obviously it'd be it'd be effective uh and you have a better understanding of, of what it is but like i don't know if it's a if it's a year-long thing that you need to be checking every game as well you know like it, uh, the expense of that just wouldn't be wouldn't justify it in some situations but in your uh, in your presentation, you said or you had you had touched on drop jump uh, and body fat. So you were saying players who completed more spins had a higher drop jump or higher drop jump, and they had lower body fat. So, and we may have touched on it earlier, but does does increasing your jo- drop jump itself will that in, in your research or from from uh, your understanding of it would that improve the amount of sprints you can do in a game? Yeah, our, our results would suggest that. So I think it was body fat, drop jump, and your lactate thresholds. Those kind of combine to predict how many sprints you do. So that would tell us that if you had a player, um, if he improved his body composition, he became more powerful as measured by the drop jump, and he became more of an efficient runner. All those things that combine, and he'd, he'd result in him doing more sprints during a game. Which would yeah result in a better performance then as well. On top of that, like yeah. you can see how that would, would would play into it. So it's a, it's an interesting one, and I'm the only reason I was asking that I want to get like a couple of takeaways. Anyone that's listening to this, like what can you look at yourself individually in the gym, especially like at the moment we're out of the gym. There's not a lot of people able to get to like to, to that have access to a gym with the with the lockdown and that. But you could still a drop drop jump is something that you could practice at home. Do you know, it's something easy. You could just throw a box up and obviously get your warm up right and do all that and get everything get everything uh, in order. But it's a simp- It's such a simple exercise. It doesn't need any real equipment to do it. So it could be something that people could start working on now. And Definitely. going, and this might be a small bit outside of, 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 of what you were saying, but the, is there a difference then in between repeated measures of uh, an explosive activity, like a powerful activity, like a drop jump? So is it, are you looking for individual drop jump or, or a single drop jump where they come down and look at their height? Or have you seen any research or have you looked into yourself uh, anything on repeated drop jumps and what that would mean or what that would how that transfers to performance no well, that's a very interesting point obviously that's that's spot on really because you're going to have to repeat the thing over the match um but i would say does um the research that has kind of correlated this kind of stuff they just take we'll say the one one time max performance um but i suppose in the real world if you've improved your your drop jump height just for once your max performance Almost certainly, your your capacity to perform a repeated drop jumps is going to go up as well. Um, so they'd be so highly correlated. I'd say if you focused on improving your max power, that your ability to repeat a higher power would go up as well. I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's something. It's something that I can see, uh, like down the line, that people were or, or researchers or and I could be wrong. I could be way off with this, but it's something I can see going into a small bit more because uh, single measures are excellent because they show like absolute power straight out but a repeated measure is more relatable to a game in terms of if, when you're running when you're running or if you're jumping like that uh, how quick your body is able to recover within a game or how quick to this would be touching into your side of things but like that neuromuscular junction or the neuromuscular control or how quick that can actually recover to do the same power output again to get the same power output again so it's an interesting one and i can see down the line people looking into that a small bit more and the only reason i, I i'm touching on that is actually i saw uh is it strong by science do you follow strong by science on instagram yes yeah There's, i keep an eye on them they're very good excellent yeah, yeah they, they were talking about that specifically about uh, how the individual measures are top class and they're a great measure of absolute power out and out but these repeated measures may be in future more uh, relatable to performance so i think it'd be an interesting one uh, maybe maybe down the line looking into a small bit more um or i must look into well, myself and see what that's looking at yeah but um yeah now just moving on from there now we, we were talking and i like just before this we were talking about uh body fat percentage and you were saying a lower body fat percentage uh means that a lot of the time you have an increased performance well from from that and that doesn't always mean that but how would that correlate you know or what's your thoughts on that yeah, I suppose body composition, um, we were nearly a bit surprised that it almost had an influence on basically every workload measure. It was one of the top ones for them. We 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 kind of hypothesized that maybe sprint speed and VO2 max would be the best. Um, 
But I suppose body composition has an influence on so many things. So it's going to influence your ability to efficiently run, your ability to jump, change direction. So I suppose if you're at a given, we'll say weight, if you're carrying more body mass, um, you're you're going to have to resist against resist harder against the forces when you're doing uh, the forces of gravity when you're performing every acceleration. So you're carrying more load. So you're just in general under more increased physiological strain just having to carry a higher body mass. Um, and it can also impact your ability to dissipate heat. So obviously when you're exercising in intensity in the match, if you have a lot of excess fat tissue, it can be harder to dissipate heat and that can cause fatigue in and, in and of itself. Um, so I think just generally it kind of makes sense that in a match you're doing everything against gravity. And if you're carrying more body mass, everything is going to be a little bit harder because you have to work against the forces of gravity, if that makes sense. So yeah. it does make sense that it influenced so many different factors. Um, exactly. So. And it'd be correlated as well in terms of like, uh, it'd be hard to have a, a extremely high VO2 max um, if you are, it'd be, it'd be hard to, to, to be able yeah. to have all these repeated measure, uh, uh, repeated straight sprints and be able to run a lot of times or even as I was saying, it'd be hard to have a high CO or VO2 max without having a low body fat percentage to get there yes. in the first place. You need to, you, you're going to be burning the calories. So definitely, I can definitely. see how that, how it would be as an overall measure, how it would be, uh, how it would have a massive effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now looking at that, so body fat percentage was one, the drop jump was another one. And then one of the, one of an, an ex America, and when we talked about this first, it made so much more sense to me. Um, like when I saw you going through the presentation, I was like, it does make sense. But when we actually walked, talked through it, um, I got a better understanding of it. The relative versus absolute strength. So you tested relative yeah. strength versus absolute. What does that mean? And how would you explain that to people? Yeah, what? so uh, just one sec. Yeah, so just, I suppose with strength, you might, coach might be wondering, well, why is strength really important for Gaelic football? Um, it has a key influence on recovery. So if, you're, if your muscles are stronger, they're better able to deal with higher forces. So every sprint you do causes less of an impact. Um, so what we found as well, interestingly, when we compared, we initially put in our data with just the absolute strength. So we'll say player A and B both squatted 120 kilos and we used that as a marker. Then what we did, we accounted for the relative uh, strength. So we accounted for their body weight. We say player A was 60 kilos and he squatted 120 uh, kilos. So we said that was two. And then player would say B, he might have been 90 kilos. So if you think they both have the same strength, but player B is 90 kilos. So every time he accelerates, it's going to be harder because just because he's the same strength, but he's working against a heavier mass. So I suppose it does make sense to account for the body weight with the strength. Um, so we did find that it was a lot, a lot better predictor when we did account for the body weight. Um, and then what were you looking at exactly? So when you were, when you were counting for first round, what, like, what specific exercises were you looking at? Uh, so we looked at the uh, squat and the hip thrust, uh, the one repetition maximum for the both of them. Uh, so the squat was a better predictor in general. Um, we included the hip thrust because we wanted to have a vertical component and a horizontal component. So we thought that might relate to uh, sprint markers. Um, but the squat was generally a better predictor. Um, so I suppose it had a big influence on recovery in that the stronger players presented with less muscle damage. So as I said, if, if the stronger muscle, what they do during the match is going to have less of an impact, they're going to have less muscle damage initially. And then as a result of that, they're going to recover quicker. And that's what we saw, that the stronger players bounce back quicker. Yeah, and just, and the, you had a, a great analogy the last day we were talking, you were saying, uh, on the bench press, how, do, how if you look at a bench press and yeah. uh, so, someone who's uh, used to benching 90 kilo and someone who's used to benching 70 kilo and you both put them on a 60 kilo bench press and you you uh, look at muscle damage after, you can obviously see the person who's used to benching 90 kilo won't have as much muscle damage because the body will be more used to it and they'll, re they'll recover faster from benching 60 kilos as the person yeah. whose max bench is a 70 kilo bench. And I thought that was an excellent analogy to describe it because it gives you a way better uh, understanding of like general physical preparedness and how important it is in, in GA in any sport at all. Um, but how, how important that just building the body up, making it as strong as possible and making it as mobile as possible. So that you're able to, you're obviously you're strong and you're breaking through tackles and that, but you need to be able to move. You need to be able to move left and right. So I know that's, 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 that's moving away from the physiological side of things and not looking at more of the neurological side of things, uh, when you're talking about movement, but, uh, just, I, th I just found that such an interesting um, point or, or, or result from your study that 
by building strength and by building uh, relative, it's relative strength, isn't it? As, as opposed to absolute strength, it's re- relative strength is the yeah. most important thing by building relative strength. So the person who is, who's 60 kilo needs to increase their, or if they have a, a 2.0 squat in terms of their, their squat in 120, they're better prepared for a game in a way, not all the time, but then someone who's 90 kilo and they can bench 120. So it's, yeah. it's a definitely a takeaway, I think. And it's, it's a takeaway that a lot of people look at is you don't always have to compare yourself to the, the biggest lad in the gym when you're, when you're working out or the biggest lad on the team and what they're lifting. It's, it's what you can lift compared to your body weight is, is such a, an important marker, especially when it comes to recovery after the games. Yeah, because yeah, because it is it's your own body weight that is the resistance in the match. So that's you kind of forget that that's what you're working against. Whatever weight you wear, that's the weight you have to propel. So it makes sense that a relative would be more specific, um, which it was. Yeah, yeah, and then when you're just like just going through that point of and following on from that, uh, and we were talking about actually structuring a week as well, and we were saying like if you were doing a week and if you were looking at your like let's say if you had a a match on a Sunday, like how would you plan your week or how would you, if you were working with a team at the moment now, and they can be at any level, they can be from, from junior to an elite level athlete, how would you plan your week? And then what do you have to take into account in the GAA specifically, because it's so different to, to other sports and that it's an amateur sport that we yeah. don't have professionals. Like, so what would you take into account? And then how would you structure the week? Yeah, I, I suppose that, that was the big, I suppose, motivator for our research in the first place that, GA practitioners are working off data from soccer players, Australian rules, uh, even rugby or whatever they're basing their analysis off. So there's nothing done in Gaelic football. So we needed to look at that specifically just for to account for, as you said, it's the amateur status. Players have work to deal with, study stressors, all different things. And obviously the sport in itself is different, different demands. Um, so you really do need to specifically look at Gaelic football um, just to kind of determine what might what might be the best approach for your training. Um, but it would have been very interesting if we had, if we conducted a much bigger analysis and were able to say, this is what the players structured their week. Um, so what I did, I worked with a number of teams to connect, uh, and a number of different matches. So there was many different factors, we say tactical factors, many different things that could impact what happened during the game. Um, and obviously different teams and different players. Um, but it would be good to see what they did, how they structured their week, and see if we could do that better. Just by the fact that their CK was high going into the game, that might suggest that maybe the structure they were using at the minute wasn't maybe the best because they were some way fatigued going into the game. Um, but just, I suppose, looking at other researchers, um, I know you've Dr. Dr. Adam Owen has a lot of good stuff, flow, high performance, uh, Josh McAllister and others, just looking at the weekly structure. Um, so we'll say if you had a Sunday match, so obviously that's a max effort. You might just, well, I suppose the way I might structure it with the team I'm with at the minute, you'd have Monday for a day off. And then I'd put maybe Tuesday, a low effort day. So you could have, they say upper body gym. And if you wanted, you could do like a low intensity skill session, um, but just so it's not too taxing there. Um, and then you could have a moderate effort Wednesday. So you could have a small side of game. And then you could do your lower body gym work there. So you could include something like cluster sets or other power work as well. Uh, and then Thursday, you'd have a, maybe a high effort there. So that would depend. That would vary depend whether it was championship, maybe your league. You might swap Thursday and Wednesday and keep the higher effort one day further away from the match. Uh, but just Thursday there, you could have high effort. You could do more intensive training, acceleration work. And if, if you weren't getting enough from the team sport practice you could do some interval conditioning or something like that and then friday you'd have a low effort day so maybe some sprint work a short session so high intensity but a low volume you could do if you wanted to do two uh, if you want to hit everything twice in the gym you could do a full body session with again low volume so obviously you don't want to be fatigued going into the game uh, next sunday and then you could take saturday off or you could do maybe a light power uh, low volume power session there and then just obviously with the match Sunday coming up. So there's, I suppose, lots of different ways you could tweak it or change things. But just looking at, I suppose, a lot of general research from other team sports, that might be a logical kind of way just to sequence it. But obviously, again, as you said, the amateur status, you've, you've, your lads might be able to come to that many trainings or structure it that way. Um, but just even from the team I'm working with, uh, they've kind of adapted a lot in that a lot of them have equipment themselves at home. 
So they have a lot of home gyms now and they're able to do things better. So you could you could save a lot of time for players in the evenings doing that. They could just do their own small thing at home, save them coming in for a gym and training and things like that. Excellent. So it depends, it depends on a number of factors, really, and who you're working with, I suppose. Top class. So that's exactly like you couldn't ask for any better than that. Now, you literally laid out day by day what you would do, and that's exactly what I was looking for. So um, I just have a couple of questions on what you were, what you were saying there, and like I think you excellent idea. If you're if you have a if you have a match Sunday, Monday should be off. It should be off, yeah. and then Tuesday should be even like you were saying an upper body gym session or even like an active recovery session on top of that as well is is, is important. Yeah. Now, when would you fit in? Just looking at that week, and you may have mentioned it because I was jotting notes down the back here. When would you fit in a, a lower limb session during the week, a gym session, or would you um, have, have you looked into that, yeah. or would you be trying to avoid it, or what would you think? No, no, I definitely would include something. So you want to be. You definitely want to maintain your your uh, neuromuscular performance and strength and power and all that. So I suppose you don't want to be dropping off so that you're declining because obviously, even from our research, we found that strength and power will aid your performance. So it's very important to maintain these over the season that you're doing some form of gym work. It doesn't have to be very much. It takes very little volume of strength work just to maintain what you have, your strength and power. Obviously, it's it's difficult to improve. It would be difficult to improve during the season on top of all your training demands and everything but you can just do a small bit you can maintain what you have um it's a it's very important to do that so that you can maintain your performance and it'll aid recovery as well so just maintaining that bit of gym work it'll keep your strength high and then you should uh, recover better uh, based on our results perfect uh, so, sorry just to answer your question there um i'd have the upper the lower body we say wednesday um so you could have if you're having a training, it'd be maybe a bit more of an intense small side of game and then a, like a lower body uh, gym session. So you could do something like cluster sets or something. So it's not too taxing, uh, but you're maintaining the power and strength by doing something like that. Perfect. And that leads me on to my next one then. Uh, what, what is a cluster set exactly or how would you describe a cluster set? Um, yeah, so that's, it's a, a thing I might, I, I'll probably bring in with the team I'm with. So um, not even cluster sets, we could say you could do something like rest redistribution. So we we'll say like you might be prescribed to do three sets of six at whatever weight, 100 kilos, we we'll say. Um, instead of that, you could just, in the sa exact same time frame, you could reverse the sets and reps. So instead of doing three sets of six, which would be quite uh, taxing, you could do six sets of three at the same weight. So you could just half the, half the rest time. It's the exact same session duration. Um, but the research says that that's, uh, it's not as perceptually difficult. So the kind of athletes doing this don't find it as difficult and it maintains power even better and it'll maintain strength and size. So it's a little bit easier for the players. So you'd have less fatigue and also it can improve their power a bit more because obviously if you're just doing three reps instead of six reps, you're going to be a lot more powerful and explosive, uh, but just you're doing more sets. So that seems like a good approach maybe for some in season um, that's kind of a thing I might use. Excellent, Jesus. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm definitely going to take that down now with because uh, especially the guys that I'm that I'm working with as well at the moment, and they could be from they could be from any level at all. But looking at the elite guys uh, and looking at their schedule, it's very similar to what you were saying. So some of them have a, like a nearly a maintenance and uh, a progression yeah. day. So on a Tuesday, like just looking at uh, off the top of my head, one guy who's working with or who's in the Premier League at the moment, and he's training on a Tuesday is a maintenance session, and on a Thursday then it's a uh, power session. So he's probably looking for that PAP or that post-activation differentiation nice, yeah, yeah. before that. That's what the team is looking for. That. That's in season. So obviously out of the season, it's going to change a lot. But yes. what you were saying there now on cluster sets now, and I, I'm, I'm going to start getting real detailed in the questions. So if you, if you, if you don't, well, don't want to answer them at all, you can just turn off the mic and, and say the internet was gone. But <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm joking. But basically, you were saying cluster sets. What you were saying there is 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 perfect. You were saying a uh, six by three is a great way of doing it. Now, if you were to pick, let's say, two exercises or three exercises that you would run in season with a team, what specific exercises would you pick yourself? Um, for uh, for strength training or so, power training things like that. Or... Let's say midweek. Uh, yeah, let's say midweek. It's that Wednesday Wednesday lower limb session. They had a match the Sunday before, and they have a match this Sunday again. So what exercises would you look towards or what exercises would you pick uh, that, to include in that session, that lower limb session that they're going to be doing those cluster sets? Uh, maybe if they had access, uh, hex bar deadlift uh, could be a, a brilliant thing to use. Obviously with uh, field sport athletes, if you're 
if they can squat, it's fine. But I suppose a lot of times you'll have issues, technique issues, and they mightn't be, they mightn't have enough load for what they can actually do, but it's more of a technique issue that's limiting them. But with the hex bar deadlifts, you can get into the perfect position. Um, I think for field sports, it's probably better than just a straight bar deadlift. Because I suppose with the straight bar, you're kind of working your way around the bar and there's more technique again. With the hex bar, you just, you know, you can slot in, you can keep a straight back a lot more easily and you can, you can obviously modify it so that if you have straighter legs, uh, it's kind of more of a hamstring exercise. But if you're obviously squatting down, it's more of a quad exercise. So it's good like that. I think that would be a good one to do. Um, and then obviously some power things as well. You could do plyometrics, other things like that, just to maintain power. And then looking at that, that's excellent. Yeah, because the hex bar is something I'm seeing uh, teams use a lot more, and it's definitely yeah. Though know, you are seeing people using it a lot more, it's definitely underutilized in terms of the effects oh, that it has because it's such a good pattern. It's just that squat pattern. It's as you were saying, and you can lift it. You can um, you can lift so much more weight with it, and also you're you're using your arms as well. So it, it's just it's an excellent full body exercise. Now, when you're talking about, you're going to be sick of me now, but when you're talking about power exercises, what type of power exercises would you look at? Um, you could do just regular plyometrics. You could do drop jumps, uh, vertical jumps, um, different bounds, things of like that. You could also just do upper body ballistic stuff. So we say med ball slams, things of like that. So I think it might, it might be good definitely in season. Power, uh, it doesn't generate too much fatigue, um, but it'll maintain your output and your kind of adaptations you made during the, the yeah, pre-season or off-season. So obviously the pre-season, off-season, those are where you really drive home and get the strength to power up. And then in-season, you just try and just maybe maintain it so that you can focus more on your team sport training. Um, okay, good, good, good. Uh, excellent. And then moving on from, let's say, your drop jump, let's say you, you were doing a jump jump or you're doing a vertical jump and you're including it in your session, like what sets and reps would you be looking at? Yeah, um, I suppose just low enough volume stuff, really. Um, but I think uh, probably an important point to note, obviously the drop jump... Um, was a key factor for our results in predicting what the players will do. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that just we we'll say doing lots of drop jump is going to improve your drop jump. So it might be like uh, it might be just generally improving their strength and power could improve their drop jump, and then therefore we we'll say improve uh, their performance that way. So I suppose a, key, uh, a thing to note is that all these fitness attributes are going to impact each other as well. So you've a lot of things impacting many other stuff. So that's kind of important to notice or to note when you're looking at our analysis, really. Um, but just with, I suppose, power, you could do maybe even just three by three or something like that. Low volume, kind of low enough impact stuff. If you were going before the match, you could even just do concentric only if you could. So we say maybe starting from a seated position. Um, so just limiting the eccentric or the lower end. So it all depends, really, um, on what phase or how far away you are from the game and things like that. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Command. So, like, then now, like, anyone that's listened to that can will have an idea themselves if they're planning a session in season. That's why. I, that's why I was asking you specifics on that. What would you? What way would you do it? Yeah. Um. So that's good. Excellent. Uh, take from that. Now, when we're looking at structure in the week, and this probably comes back to coaches and, and, and players themselves. And you were talking Monday off, Tuesday upper body, Wednesday small sided games or, or skill stuff, and then lower limb session on a Wednesday, Thursday a bit higher effort, and then Friday low volume. Now. We, because from the research that you were saying, or uh, from from your results, you were saying that it's high speed running that's affecting people. So it's high speed. As long as you're not doing high speed running, it's late in the week or very late in the week. Does that mean that a lot of the time you'll be fully recovered for a Sunday um, game? Yeah, I think it's it, it. It might be a bit um, harsh just to label just high speed running itself. So it might be good to include some speed work, but I think it's just the the key thing is the volume of high speed running. So we say if you're doing lots and lots of sprints, it may be just too many. Um, yeah. So it might be a good idea just to do, we'll say, just a few, we'll say, 15-meter sprints with a long rest period. Um, but I think you could run into problems if you were doing, we'll say, too many or too long of a distance, and that was going to cause a lot of muscle damage. So you could, I suppose, treat it nearly as like a, a power movement and just do very low volume and just to maintain speed. But I suppose it's all to do with the dose, the training dose that could have a negative impact if you overdid it. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's good. Like that's, yeah, that's what I was, that's kind of what I was getting at is if you were, but then again, it's going to be very difficult to improve overall fitness, but okay. So now looking at that and let's say, let's say we'll, we'll structure it the way it really is. And we'll, we'll be finished up now after this question or after the next couple of questions, I've only a few more. So no let's, say, let's say you have a game 
on a Sunday. Now, what I'm looking at here now is in championship, usually you have a game Sunday, then you get the next week off and you have a game the week after. Okay. So in season, you're with a team and it's an intermediate or senior senior football team. And you have a game on a Sunday uh, and then you don't have another game for another week or let's say two weeks after that. So you get the next weekend off and then you're playing the next weekend and it's either Saturday or Sunday. Is there a way that you would change around yourself in your own opinion? How would you change uh, the structure of your week there in that way? Yeah, um, I suppose if you had if you had the free weekend, you could bias more work towards that. So you could include maybe another lower body session there in place of the match or maybe a more intense training. So we say more small or medium sided games, something like that. Um, so you could definitely, you could up the dose of training really in around where the match would be and then just kind of taper it back in the similar format leading up to the previous match. Okay. Um, so so you could definitely, the fact that you have the free weekend there, you could definitely include more work, I would think. Yeah. And would it be beneficial to include more work? Uh, maybe not as intense as the match, but you could definitely, you could include another leg session or some, or lower limb session. Um, and you could include more, maybe another small side of game, maybe not as intense as a match will be, but just to keep the skills there and yeah. just have some acceleration, deceleration work so that you're maintaining your qualities, I suppose, going into the next match. Okay. Okay. And then uh, now this could be a, this could be just like uh, an awful question to put you under, but uh, from when I was in the States and I was working over there, we were, I, w- I was working with runners and one of the coach, uh, I was working with, with a couple of teams, I was working with basketball teams and uh, football teams. Uh, one of the other teams I was working with was a running team. Um, and now it was, it was a uh, 10k runs. So basically they were saying that it takes around about 10 days to get the benefits of a, a run, a long distance run. Okay. That's basically what they were saying in and around. Now you could, you could correct this on the spot and I, I, I'd be corrected forever after forever more. So they were taking, saying it takes around about 10 days to get the performance benefits of a run, a long distance run. Um, so th- is there any research shown how long it takes to, for sprints? Or have you ever looked into that yourself? Um, I'm not too familiar now with exact, we we'll say if you're doing like a 10K or something like that, but I think the, the turnaround for adaptation for speed is a lot quicker. So even a few days, a few days later, you might start to see adaptations. I, th- I think in general, I may be wrong now, but I think the much longer distance aerobic work is kind of a slower adaptation process. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I suppose it's more cardiovascular as well. Like, uh, you're taking a lot, of, a lot of that into account while sprinting, you are taking into, uh, it's more neurological, isn't it? As opposed to anything else. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too familiar now with, I suppose, distance kind of runners or things of like that um, or different training things for those. But that, that'd that be kind of my, if I was to, if I was to make an estimate, I would say that anyway. Okay, good. Well, yeah. No, that's, I just said, I, I just said I, I'd stick an onion when it, when it came into, it came into my head. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll start to finish up on this now. There's just, like, what I want to ask you and looking at what you've done and, like, we were talking about this and we were talking about what your, your plans are in the future and what you want to go at. So what are the practical implications? Just a quick conclusion or a quick uh, idea. What are the pra- practical implications of the studies that you've done and the results from them? And what do you think people can take away from now? Uh, and, like, whether it be a coach or a player, or even if it opens up the discussion with between coaches and players of how to structure a training, what are the practical implications of the uh, results of your studies so far? Yeah, I suppose from from looking at the components of fitness, uh, the key implications for when you're looking, when if you're if you're a player or a coach and you're looking to increase the total workload being done, we would say enhancing body composition, your ability to uh, run over short distance, so your sprint speed, uh, your and your aerobic capacity, and your lower body strength. So those seem to be the key factors. If you're a player looking to improve your workload, improving your run, yeah, your body composition, your run and speed over five meters, we we'll say, and your power, and then your aerobic capacity. Those are the key metrics if you want to increase your workload. Um, and then I suppose the other side of the coin, if you want to reduce the fatigue you experience during the game and improve your recovery. So obviously that's key in Gaelic football where it's a very long season, especially for younger players, you could be engage in a multi-sport activity or multi-team activity. You could be with the college team and all that. So obviously recovery is a, a huge factor in Gaelic football. Um, so with that, improving your strength and aerobic, uh, aerobic capacity is likely to reduce, uh, result in reduced fatigue and improve recovery. So we found that even despite undertaking greater workloads. So just in general, 
the the aerobically fit, uh, the powerful and strong players, not only did they complete more work during the game, but they also recovered uh, faster. So it's like a two pronged benefit. So you'll do more work, but also you'll recover better if you're better conditioned, really. Um, okay, excellent. Come on, that's 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 top class. Um, so basically, uh, not basically, but I know because you've a lot of you've a lot of time put into this. Uh, so I don't want to minimize it to or, or reduce it to just one one sentence. But general physical preparedness is a huge thing with recovery, and it's from kind of from what you're saying. And obviously, that's come back to reducing risk of injury and increasing performance. But actually, being better physical physically prepared for a game is going to leave you so you can actually recover faster and get the benefits from that game because you are like people forget, even though you are getting broken down in a game and even though the body's breaking down, it will adapt and you will get stronger yeah. for the next game if you have time, obviously, between them. Um, and I think that's, you made a couple of really good points there on structure in the week and how you could structure a week better to give yourself the best chance to recover for a game. Realistically, now there's obviously depends what level people are at. Um, and if you're in college, you could be playing, you could be playing under 21 or under 20s now at the moment. You could be playing club and you could be playing club under 20s as well. And you could be playing county. You could, we might be playing hurt and football. So there's a lot of that it you have to, has to be taken into account as well. But I think from the way you structured that week, I think that's a huge takeaway for people who listen to this podcast um, and who want to make the most out of it because there's a lot of players and a lot of guys that I work with, especially who are, let's say, they might not be playing inter-county, but they're still doing all the right things and they want to get everything right because when it comes down to your own performance, you want to get everything, you want to take all the boxes, you don't want to leave any, any stone unturned and you want to be in the best position to, you want to put yourself in the best position so that you can, let's say, play for your team or even do it for yourself as well. So I think how you structure that week um, is excellent. It's a huge takeaway for people. And I think another big takeaway as well is that strength, that uh, that relative strength. How it's not You're not comparing yourself to the strongest guy in the gym. You're comparing yourself to your, your let's say, even guys that are the same weight as you or your own weight and, and seeing what you can do and seeing how heavy you can lift based on your own weight, which a lot of people would do anyway. You know, That's what you would do anyway. But it's the most important thing uh, when it comes to, or one of the most important things when it comes to recovery is that you really need to look at what you can do for yourself all the time. Don't be comparing yourself to guys who are lifting crazy weight because I know guys on our team that could be, you know, they'd be 100, 100, 100 kilo, let's say, or 102 kilo, and they might be only squatting uh, 120 or 130 kilo. While like if you, I know other guys in the team who could be in and around about, let's say 70 kilo, and they might be pushing 130, 140. Like I know yourself, what what weight what weight are you squatting at the moment for or when you when you were weight when you were when you won the title what were you squatting because i know it was a sick weight uh 150 for two is my best anyway <laughs> and what weight are you what weight were you yourself when you were squatting about 70 kilos for that so. jesus yeah so that type of strength now you should be a you should be a, a gaa player at that time that way yeah football anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a different i know it's a different it's a different type of uh it's a different type of fitness but still that type of uh, relative strength is a huge one, a big one for people to take away. And the last massive takeaway, or big big thing I think uh, that you touched on was the fact that it's not total distance covered, that it's high speed running. So I think yeah. or that, that, that's having an effect on people. And I know you said don't single it out to that specific thing itself. But in my mind then, I think guys who are running 10Ks trying to get fit for a thing just like and we know it ourselves, like you know yourself, having teams running 10Ks and 5Ks all the time isn't the way to go like i know with with um with some of the let's say the teams that i, I were working with or uh, guys that i were working with that were playing um professional so let's say uh like playing in premier league they would have a new type of a, a, a fitness regime so what they would do is they would run a 5k but they'd run one kilometer they'd take two minutes off they'd run one kilometer and you had to match the same time so you had to match the same time every single time or, or close to it which makes a lot more sense than just running a 5K and being fast at the start and slow at the end. So I think what you're doing at the moment is excellent. You have, you're, going, you're looking in the right direction. And even from talking to you, you it looks like that you're going further afield, going further down that rabbit hole um, into, into what, what, what changes are. What, what's your next study looking at or what hopefully? Looking uh, at? We're looking, we're actually, we're still recruiting now. So we'll be up there for another, until Sunday now. So we have another two days of it. Um, we're just recruiting... Uh, basically all Gaelic games athletes so male and female all adult players and we're going to compare the different sports and just see we're going to assess basically what uh, the players annual training structure is so if they have any time off in the year how many teams do they play with in the year do they play other sports and then we're also looking at things like their nutrition 
different recovery strategies if they do anything. Um, and we're just kind of does we're just going to assess what's going on out there and see are they in line with what they should be doing or what's optimal or we say is is hurling better than football or camogie and all that. We're just going to compare all these things. Obviously, we haven't really we haven't looked at the results yet. We're still kind of recruiting for that, but it will be interesting to see in the coming months yeah. when we do get that paper out anyway. Um, so yeah, that'd be interesting. Cool, good. And on fairness, you're you're leading the way, especially. And I always found that film was was excellent for that. Um, leading the way in terms of, of, of sports performance in Ireland and what you can do and GAA specific. They're really, really focusing in on GAA and, and there's not a lot of places doing that around the country at the moment. So it's, it's excellent to see it. But um, yeah, so that's everything everything from today. Uh, thanks a million, Larkin, for coming on and, and chatting to me. I know it ran over a small bit, extra, a small bit longer than expected, but I feel that there's a lot of takeaways there for people who are listening to it. And I took a lot away myself. I've a, I've a book full of notes here again, now that I'm going to have to be looking through and I'll, I'll be implementing it with my own um, people uh, or my own clients, I should say. So just uh, anything you want to leave behind or anything you want to, you want to finish up on or where would people find you as well? If they wanted to get in contact. Um, yeah, I suppose um, I'm mainly on Twitter. If they wanted um, at Lorcan daily 10, um, I have the Instagram thing there. Uh, Gaelic Research, I think it's called, or Gaelic Games Research. Um, so you could contact me in either of those. Uh, you can give me a message there, and I'd, I'd get back to you anytime. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and if anyone wants to, definitely get in contact with myself as well, and I will, um, I, I can pass on any questions that you have to Larkin as well. So I might even make a template up of how you've, how of what you were talking about there of structure in a week. I think I might even make a template up on that, and I'll, I'll tag you in it as well, or tag the Gaelic Games in it. Um, because there's well, a just to note on that now that's I, I based that on other researchers now just to I oh I know yeah, yeah but yeah. that's the best way to do it like just the best yeah, way it's not yeah. just opinion then <laughs> it's a, no no no, no based no. on other opinions <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, yeah or data from other opinion I suppose but no I I like I, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely I'll pop that up and I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll uh, make sure to tag you and you can whatever you want to then you can you can take whatever I know you wouldn't be one for taking um taking that uh, credit for it but you definitely deserve it in terms of the round of research that you've done around this and i'm sure in the next couple of years there'll be a lot of benefits taken from it so uh yeah so thanks a million again Ark. For... Well, thanks a million for having me robbie it was very enjoyable no, not at all and we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll have to make another one sooner uh, yeah 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 and number two because there's, there's a lot more we could speak on that um no, no, you for sure definitely but okay guys so thanks a million for listening in again this week um if anyone wants to get in contact with me you can check me out on instagram at mobility tutor and then check larkin out on instagram at gaelic games uh, if you have any questions make sure to send them through that or you can send that mobility tutor at gmail.com um and then on from that the best way you could if you think you know anyone who'd be interested in this podcast i'd love if you could send it on to them or even share it on your story if you took anything away from it um and the, I, this time of the year, is a, I suppose it's a good time to, to, to get a grip or get an understanding of this because you have so much time before we get into season and championship is later in the year. So it's going to be really important for people to take care of this now. So as I said, guys, if anyone wants to get in contact with us, look through Instagram, Larkin is on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Twitter yet. I never made that, made that leap. I don't think I will at this stage, but uh, I don't know if I miss it much. Am I? You're better off downsizing at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. But uh, yeah, that's everything, guys. Thanks a million for listening, and we will chat to you all again next week. Have a good one.